Welcome to Eat Your Content Podcast, your home for all things food and pop culture. I am your host, Rich Herrera. Just a reminder to follow me on socials, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, TikTok, YouTube, at Rich Herrera and at Eat Your Content. A couple of programming reminders. Uh, we are continuing Top Chef recaps all season, so make sure you like and subscribe and hit that bell notification button so you'll know when new episodes drop each and every week. we got only a couple of weeks to go, uh, so make sure you follow and uh, be notified of, of when those drop. Joining me once again this week, uh, Chef Amadeus, a man who has never seen a table he didn't want to throw food all over. How are things going for you, sir? Everything is great. Um, yeah, it, it's been a good week. Um, a lot of fun things happening, but we'll talk about that later. Um, <laughs> right now, I'm just um, heartbroken, disappointed, crying. Yeah. I'm going to say disappointed. Just, yeah, we got a little, little, little sad. Got a lot to talk I'm about. Not disappointed. That's the thing. I'm not disappointed. I'm just a little sad. That's all. Yeah, we got a we got a lot to talk about this uh, this episode. <laughs> uh, I, I thought overall, it, it, this was probably a, a better episode in in an otherwise fairly lackluster season um, in terms of a lot of things like production and challenges and and overall cookery. But I, I think this episode was was better um, and. And, you know, we're almost at the end, so, I mean, it has no nowhere to go but get better. So, yeah, so let's get right into it. Um, the show opens, everybody's talking about kind of being homesick and being away from your family for a while. I know when I talked to uh, Buddha and Sarah last uh, la- during last season's uh, Top Chef episodes, they they talked about, you know, they're away from their family for like two months or something like that. So... Um, I thought it was really cool to learn that Savannah's dad, he retired and became a knife maker in retirement and made some custom knives for her. So she has kind of a piece of home with her. I thought, man, that's got to be cool to, to you know, have your dad's knives that he made just for you, just for this occasion uh, to, to carry with you to through the show. And um, Dan talked about her, his wife being, you know, only five minutes away because he's the local guy and so, so close, so far away. And um, you know, you were on Food Network on a food competition, Extreme Chefs, back in the day. Um, how how long were you gone? I, I don't remember it being kind of a multi-episode. It was a multi-episode show, wasn't it? Or or no? It was just one episode, right? No, it was. Yeah, it was only one episode. I was only gone for a day and a half, two at the most. Because you were but down in Mexico. We were down in California. We was on a set. Uh, uh, but, oh, okay. But I think that the but what what was interesting is I've always gone for, you know, a short period of time, but I still thought about my family because of what I was doing and how it would, you know, make the family proud, you know, that, that kind of stuff. Right. You know, I, I had my, my family was, they were you know all excited for me and everything. Um, and if I know if I felt that after two days, I can only imagine what they are feeling after two months, a month, a week, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. It's, it's, um, but you know, here's the thing. I've been separated from my family, uh, when I was in the military and we were like, we go on a six month cruise. We can't back then. I was, I, there was no social media. There was snail mail. <laughs> oh, yeah. And when the mail call came, we were just so excited just to hear, just to read, you know, letters from from home, and I, and especially somebody like Dan, like you said, my wife's like right over there, and I can't even, <laughs> I can't even do anything with her because, you know, but um, I, I feel sorry for them. I can say sorry, but I feel them. I feel their their loneliness. Um, but like I said, for those that are out there um, that have people competing, you know, just be patient. They'll be home soon. <laughs> and, yeah, and they're fairly sequestered. I mean, they they see just really each other and the producers and the judges for however many you know weeks in a row, and so they don't they don't get to go out, they don't get to see other people or things, and and they're just like in their hotel room, just stuck. And, so and see, that was the that was one of my main reasons why I took the the opportunity to go out for the uh, Food Networks event. Because I didn't want to spend time with anybody. And it was because, and everybody who's been in the military knows, you have no choice who you sleep with in your birthing. 
So in my birthday, there may be like 24 people in a birthday, whether you like it or not. So the guy that snores, the guy that's, you know, has hygiene issues and things like that, you ain't got no choice. That's who you're going to sleep with. Yeah, yeah. That's in your birthday. So it was, so it was, was kind like, of... I wouldn't do that. If... Yeah, yeah. So it's kind of neat to see, you know, the the chefs being a little bit vulnerable and, and talking about their loved ones. And, 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 you know, it's getting close to the end, so they're kind of looking forward to you know, seeing their families again. So it's kind of nice. So uh, we open up with the quick fire and they show Tom's cooking. Tom's got the apron on. He's, he's doing his thing. And, um, and almost prophetically, they, they cut to Savannah in the car saying, I want to walk in there and see someone cooking a dish <laughs> as almost as if she was fed that line. No, I'm just kidding. I don't know, but it, it was pretty prophetic. I, I thought that was pretty funny. So he's, uh, Tom is cooking a dish for Kristen and Gail. Uh, he, he kind of called it a lobster stir fry, a sort of like cooked lobster salad. Gail said, um, and they start kind of naming off some of the ingredients. It's got lobster, obviously. Gail said it's got like ginger fennel leeks and garlic and bok choy. And um, all three judges commence eating it, clean the plate. Well, you know, leave a little bit in there. Um, and as the chefs come in, they put the the nearly empty bowl under a cloche, right? So Tom introduces um, the chef that comes back from the second half of LCK. So all the chefs are lined up. There's five but then laura comes waltzing in so she's we're kind of back up to six i, I gotta say I, I saw some of the reactions danny did not look thrilled um uh, and dan said that the biggest competition that she's the biggest competition and uh predicts that she'll be in the finals so you know uh, we're, we're not we're in very much the individual team play now we're not you know sharing budgets or anything at this point um what did you did you catch anything in the reactions of some of the chefs when Laura came walking back in? Oh yeah, they were like, you know, stop, pause, like, oh, she's back, and because she's a beast. I mean, yeah, we'll talk about her her, her dish, but yeah, she's a beast. I, I was, I mean, she was shocked that that she won Last Chance Kitchen and everything, but um, yeah, they they know, especially Danny, because he cooked with her before. He knows. She's no slouch. Yeah. He, yeah. He knows, he knows from firsthand experience she's no slouch. Because when they did that architect uh, team challenge together, yeah. Yep. He was like, yeah, you know what you're doing. So, uh, yeah. Like I say, they, if they're not worried, they should be. Yep. So all pleasantries go away, and we break down the challenge. So the challenge is they lift the the uh, – Tom says he's – under the cloche is probably the most challenging dish that they're ever going to cook. And he lifts it up and it reveals, obviously, it's the empty bowl that they're, the judges were all eating a minute ago. Uh, so the challenge is that the chefs have to ask questions to figure out what dish Tom made and then try to replicate it. So each chef gets four questions. So it's kind of like 20 questions, but four extra. So like 24 questions. So they can ask one question before the clock starts just to kind of get the, the wheels turning. And then they have to ask the rest of the questions as they're cooking, which is a really unique challenge. Uh, so they get 30 minutes and then the winner gets $10,000. What did you think of this challenge when you saw it? Uh, on a level of difficulty for, uh, for you, um, how how difficult would that be for for a, a really experienced chef at that level to look in an empty bowl with just a few leftover things in there and then asking only four questions of somebody to say yes no what was this dish it was probably one of the better challenges it was simple but mysterious it's like he's hiding the ingredients Without hiding hiding the ingredients. Yeah. Yeah. You, know, you you got yeah. I had some ingredients in the bowl, they're not there anymore. But the remnants is, so you can <laughs> smell it, just can't taste it. You can smell it, you can look at the sauce and do everything, and you know, make that dish reappear. Houdini style. Poof. There's the salad <laughs> that you did. Um I thought, like I said, I thought it was a very, very, very interesting uh, challenge. Um, and like you said, it's the most difficult one you would do because you don't know what the ingredients are. You have to, you have to um, manifest those ingredients. And some ask good questions, some ask stupid, stupid questions. Yeah, <laughs> yeah we'll, we'll get into a few of those. Uh, but yeah, I thought it was a really interesting and fun, uh, quick fire too. Um, just, you know, they, 
they did say you can come up to the bowl, you can smell it, you can look at it, uh, but you can't taste anything. So there's still some stuff there. They can't, you know, dip their finger in the bowl and, and taste what was left. Um, right. So Kristen, before they start, Kristen gives another disclaimer that how they perform in the quick fire will come into play. And if you're on the bottom of the elimination challenge, but as we learned last week and this week, with a lot of texture tests determined that was a lot. <laughs> That was a lie, Your Honor. Uh, I was, like I said, that was very disappointed this week. Very yeah, yeah. So let's get to the let's get to the challenge. So Laura asked the first question: Is it pasta? No. Savannah asked whether it's a soup. Uh, no. And then they follow up with like, is it a bouillabaisse or a porridge? And everybody's like, Dan was like, why are you asking that? They just said it wasn't a soup. Why would you think it'd be a bouillabaisse or a porridge? So I didn't know he said seafood porridge. Have you ever heard of seafood, seafood porridge? <laughs> It's like, yeah. dude, like, as soon as Manny asked that question, Dan was like, damn, dude. <laughs> so, yeah, like I say, I, I was very, with Manny this week, I was very disappointed. Yeah. Well, you know, give, giving Manny some credit, Manny and Michelle were the only two that actually go up to the empty plate and try to figure out some stuff, you know, right there at the start. Dan came up a little bit later. Um, I thought what was interesting is Savannah figured out that a walk was involved. Uh, but did not share that with anybody else. And she noticed that because she has figured out the layout of the kitchen and noticed walks were there when they were never there before. And so she thought, well, the walk's got to be involved. So she she picks up a walk and starts cooking with it, and nobody nobody clues in on that. Um, other questions, is there bok choy? Yes. Is there acid? No. Is lobster the only seafood protein? Yes. Um, Manny had an interesting strategy. He was going to kind of let everybody else ask questions while he tried to cook. He throws some tomatoes in a blender. And then the very next question after that, somebody said, is there tomato in it? Is there tomato paste in it? No. So he immediately has to stop, ha has to stop cooking and everything. But I just thought watching them run around asking questions, trying to figure out what this dish was. I thought it was great fun. I was smiling through the whole thing. So what'd you think? Yeah, it, it was a great challenge. I mean, it's, you know, it takes the 20 question game to a whole nother level. <laughs> yeah. And then only having four so, of those 24 to try to figure it out is, uh, is interesting. So, so you were waiting to see, you know, who was going to ask the right question that would click something in your head. And it was just, yeah. And Manny just, he just said, I'm Manny's, it. <laughs> Manny's problem right now. What I know about Manny right now is, and it's making me, uh, very not happy with him is, He's trying to play everything safe. Yeah. He's trying to create a middle where there's no middle. Yeah. Yeah. It's way too late to play it safe now. You got to swing for the fences. Yeah. I mean, you're like, I'm just going to sit back and let everybody else ask all the questions. But dude, you're, you're wasting time because now you find out you're not, you're making this amazing uh, tomato sauce. Like, nope, no tomato in it. Like, oh, now you got to start all over again. And I said this before, he should have been gone weeks ago. Yeah. Even yeah. though he's my guy, he, he should have been gone weeks ago. And it seems like now he, he literally is just going through the motions. He's calling everything in. He's not putting forth that passion. Or, and I, I feel like he's, he's, you know, doing it for the camera now, not for the show, mm, not to it, win. Interesting. Interesting. Because, so, I mean, because everything he's doing, when they hit him with stuff, he's like, yeah, okay, yeah, you're right. I'm still here, so whatever. Yeah. And then, interesting, interesting like you theory. said last week, last week, same thing you said. Like, man, he should have been gone. Well, he played the middle last week. So let's talk about the dishes in the quick fire. Okay, that's question 20. You have to guess. Uh, Michelle, and see how close they got. So Michelle made a marinated and poached lobster with an herb salad. Manny did a poached lobster, bok choy, lime juice, cilantro, parsley, ginger, and seafood stack. Savannah did a lobster stir fry with red Fresno chilies, bok choy, and garlic with fish sauce and soy sauce. Laura did blanched lobster with curry, Fresno chilies, garlic, parsley, and fish sauce. Dan did a lobster stir fry with lemongrass, onions, ginger, bok choy, and cilantro. And Danny did a poached lobster, fennel curry uh, with salad of bok choy, cilantro, and parsley. So the top three ended up being Savannah, Michelle, and Dan. So with Savannah, as we talked about before, she was the only one to use the wok, and Kristen loved the texture of the vegetables. Uh, Michelle was one of the closest in appearance to Tom's dish, uh, but some of the greetings weren't quite cooked enough. 
Uh, and Dan also was close in appearance. Gail was impressed with how many of the ingredients he did get right. Uh, and so Savannah was deemed the winner. She gets 10K, and that brings her total winnings up to 28K uh, in quick fire cash. So she's doing really well uh, in the last stretch. Um, and then the bottom three, Laura had her dish, and Kristen said it was in Tom's direction, but it was a bit salty. Manny was in the bottom three of this quick fire again. Uh, Gail said Manny's was also close, but too much lime juice. Um, and Danny was on the bottom. Kristen said it looked nothing like Tom's, but was the most delicious. Uh, it just wasn't Tom's dish. So Danny wasn't even close, but it tasted the best. And what they were looking for here is something to come close to what Tom made. Uh, so again, we're only down to six, no middle. You have a top three and a bottom three. Uh, what did you think of this split between the the top and the bottom? That that's a, a challenge that I, I feel as a as a uh, viewer, you really can't judge from a viewer standpoint because we never tasted it. Right. Yeah. See, the other judges had not only did they get to see it, but they get to taste what it tastes like before to what it now. Because as a viewer, you see them putting ingredients that say some of the same ingredients Tom used, but then as a judge, you get to taste Tom's and then taste theirs. Yeah. So you're right. We couldn't taste it. Uh, but looking at it, though, I, I do agree that Michelle and Dan's came close uh, to doing it. And Savannah did, too. But I think Savannah winning the thing showed that she's got a very developed palate. Like she smelled the bowl and immediately knew there was ginger and garlic. She even mentioned that, you know, she works she works in a Japanese restaurant. So she has ginger and garlic kind of what she said, like seared in her nostrils. So immediately she knows what what's in there. So. Um, good job, Savannah. Congratulations to her. She gets 28K. Again, she's peaking at the right time right here in the finals coming into it. Um, so she's doing really, really well. So the elimination challenge. I was very excited about this elimination challenge. When I saw it in the previews of last week's episode as they were rolling the credits, I was like, oh, this is going to be so fun. I, I What they had to do uh, for the elimination challenge was create a dish to be plated on and eaten from a tabletop. Uh, it can be sweet or savory. They can plate it at their station and bring it out or do a, a more dramatic plating in front of the judges. So to kind of give people an understanding of what that is, Kristen did a really good job of explaining, you know, what does um, a seafood boil, you know, how is a seafood boil served? And it's served on a table, right? Every seafood boil you go to, they lay out the newspaper, they drain the pot and throw all the crawfish, potatoes, sausage, corn, everything on the table. And everybody just kind of goes goes nuts and gets their hands dirty. This is kind of that, but chefy. So Tom mentions a couple of restaurants where this is a signature feature. So Grant Ackett's at Alinea in Chicago is probably the best example of this in the U.S. Um, he has a, a he was one of the first episode of Netflix's Chef's Table series. Uh, and if you do a YouTube search for Alinea, you're going to see it all over YouTube where they spread the dessert all over the table. Um and he mentioned another restaurant in Spain that does something different with the table. Uh, but you kind of called this out during the the chaos episode where you thought that what they did to not today's episode or last night's episode, you thought somebody should have done that during the chaos episode. So when you saw this come up, were you kind of like, okay, that's, that's, that's interesting. I'm glad they're doing that now. I, like I said, I, I was very uh, happy to see that and was looking forward to seeing the uh, true artistic and passion on the table come out of, of some of these chefs. And um, it was interesting. Yeah. Yeah. And, and Alinea, I mean, Alinea is on my bucket list of restaurants to go to uh, at some point before I die. Uh, so that is definitely something I want to experience this whole tabletop, um, you know, serving food on a tabletop where you eat it off the table would be, would be fun to watch. So the guest judge uh, is Chef Curtis Duffy, uh, you know, friend of the pod for Eat Your Content. I had him and his partner, Michael Muser, on and interviewed them uh, about, you know, the restaurant and how it became a backdrop of, you know, the bear. So he's a the executive chef of two Mission Star Restaurant ever in Chicago. Uh, so I talked to them back in episode 27 of my podcast. Uh, so if you want to go back and check that out, and there's a link floating somewhere around here if you're watching this on YouTube. If not, I'll put it in the show notes. Um, but it was really interesting talking to both of them. I thought he was a perfect chef to judge this. If not Grant Ackett's himself, uh, then uh, Curtis Duffy's great. I mean, he he is doing some really cutting edge things with food. It was really great talking to him and Michael um, about 
that whole thing that they have going on at Ever and, and The Bear Season 2. Speaking of which, The Bear Season 2 drops on June 27th, and I'm going to be doing episodic recaps of that. So again, make sure to like and follow and subscribe so you'll know when those drop. Going back to the episode. <laughs> Um, like I said, he's a great judge. Uh, his food is beautiful. Um, ever is also on my bucket list to, to go eat Chicago in general has a lot of restaurants I want to go try. Uh, but you know, I'd have to take out a second mortgage to pay for both of those meals. So, uh, maybe, maybe next time, maybe later. So we'll see. Um, so overall, I don't, I don't know if you're familiar with Curtis Duffy's work or anything, but overall, what did you think of the guest judge? Uh, as a judge and, you know, as he was talking, talking through some of these uh, dishes through the night. Well, I, 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 I'm not familiar with this uh, particular chef, but he had black fingernail polish on. <laughs> and that lets me know that he is an individual artist. He does oh, yeah. things on his own because he want to do them. You know what I'm saying? Like, I don't care what the left and right is doing. This is what I'm doing. This is how I want to do it. And it's individualized. You, it seems like his work is one as well. When you see it, you're like, oh, I know who did that. Yeah. I know exactly who did that. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it's like I say, having, having black fingernail polish on, it's like, yeah. He got yeah. some, he, he, he's, he's, he's on the edge because he's like, Shh, watch this. Y'all think that's good? Watch this. So, <laughs> um, yeah, like I said, I mean, all the judges that they brought on for each episode, for each everything, I think was spot on. I don't think that one judge they brought on did not fit the challenge. Yeah. Yeah. Even the, um, what's the name with, with the chaos challenge? Perfect guy. Perfect yeah. guy for the chaos challenge. Perfect guy for him. Um, so, yeah, like I said, I, I don't know much about the chef, but he had on black female polish. I was like, yeah. He's, he, but now you know me, I I don't pick chefs on the, what their resume is. <laughs> There's always something different about them that I that I like, and the way that he has black finger nail polish. I was like, okay, yeah, he he I I wouldn't he wouldn't shock me at anything that he does. Yeah. Yeah, he's he's really great, and uh, I was very lucky to have him on the pod, and can't wait to eat his restaurant at some point in my future. So, let's talk about the chefs and and some of the strategy they thought about going into this. And this is kind of like the chaos challenge in that it's kind of wide open, and I think a lot of judges got lost thinking about all that space. Right? They're used to, to plating on a you know on a dish or a bowl, and and here they're talking about using the table. A, a stark white table as a blank canvas. And, and I think a few really understood that assignment and then a couple got lost. So let's, let's take, let's take a look at kind of what Michelle was thinking. Um, we'll talk more during oh. judging, but I think Michelle is one of those ones that got a little bit lost. Um, she was trying to do something brunchy. She wanted to use beets and salmon and she didn't want to be cliche, which if you kind of think about what she does, she does barbecue, which is essentially eating everything off of a table with butcher paper easily could have done something there, but she didn't, she didn't want to do that for some reason and went completely outside of that. Um, so she was kind of lost, right? So what did you think about Michelle? Not really kind of embracing who she was. This was a perfect challenge for her to embrace and show off what she does and do it. But she, she didn't. I was, just shocked at what she did. Um, I I was expecting her to take what she does and put a twist on that. Crawfish boil, crab boil, barbecue, you know, all that, and lay it on a plate and just put a twist on everything, you know, that she does. Like, you know, Danny put the tape down and made the sauce and everything. You know, she could have did, you know, the sauces, the, like do some grilling, a whole bunch of grilling of things, the vegetables and all that, and make a puree of, of a vegetable. And, um, but like she said, the time got away from her. And I've said this many times on the show, time is your enemy. If you're thinking and the time is still ticking, it will eat you up. And I just feel so bad because she was just, just overwhelmed and lost at it um and she put everything in the middle of the table yeah 
really compressed didn't it. Stretch it out. Yeah, didn't stretch it out for. Yeah, like I said. But here's the thing. I'm 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 proud of her. Um, because she gave it all. She gave it her all, and the time just just ate her up. And she even said that, you know, it was the time. Time just got away from me. So, um, yeah, I was very. I felt bad that that the time got away from her. Because you know, I'm I'm always rooting for Michelle. Yeah, and you know, if you remember way back early in the season, um, Buddha and uh, Kristen went back to the stew room and told everybody, "Look, you got to cook who you are. You're not going to make it on this show, right?" They gave him that kind of stern pep talk, and and this was a perfect opportunity for her to do that. She she could have done a bunch of like barbecued or grilled meats. And splashed, you know, different barbecue sauces all over the table, had like mounds of meat all over the table, mounds of mac and cheese or mounds of coleslaw, and, you know, it, it, and chefed it up a little bit. Maybe you see those little tiny grills that they sell at like world market, you know, in shape of pigs or whatever, yeah. these little tiny ones, she could have done something like that and had like little skewers of meat. I mean, my head was going 90 to nothing thinking about how she could have done her own cooking on this now, and, and killed it. Now, here's the thing. All everything you said is absolutely correct. The only problem is you don't have that gorilla on your back while you're coming up with this. That's true, but the, the fact that she thought about it, it and said, "I don't want to be cliche," what, what, right? But here's the thing: that gorilla on your back changes the whole. You're sitting behind a microphone, like, "Yeah, I could do this, could do that," <laughs> but you don't have that gorilla on your back. Tick, 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 ticking, and she had it on her back. Here's the thing, like I said before, Michelle, everybody on my team, I picked them because of their cultures. And Michelle had everybody rooting for her. That's on her shoulders. Michelle had Michelle herself trying to do something good, trying to win this on on her shoulders. And you got that big old gorilla on your back of time, and it just it weighs you down. So that's why I say this. You know, when if time gets away from you, people can always say, well, you don't have you have poor time management. If you've never been in that spot, you have no idea what time management is. Yeah, they cut it up. Trust me, you have no idea. All those chefs that say, oh, time got away from me. I feel bad for them because, you know, I've been in a couple of competitions or a couple of events where time just got away from me. And I just so um, like I said, grilling stuff. Perfect for that. Um, just all the grilling and the, I mean, they could have been just amazing things, grills, the vegetables, the corn and the cob, everything, and got got the sauce and the squeeze ball and like. Oh yeah, yeah, you know, it would have been it would have been know, cool. And if you did different different, like you did, could did a mustard sauce, tomato sauce, oh yeah, you know, barbecue sauce, and just yeah, sling a little uh, greenery you know, over the place. Yeah, but like I said. What she did was what she had time to do. I just wish she would have spread it out a, l- a little, a little more, because it's just like plating it on. And because it was so on such a large surface, it really looked tiny. Mm-hmm. It yeah. really looked tiny. But like I said, in her defense, that gorilla got her. And yeah, if, if you've I'm, never I'm, done competition, that gorilla is, is a beast. Yeah, I mean. W- yeah, I can see her saying, well, the time got away from it. Everybody had the same amount of time, right? So nobody else had that problem. So, I mean, hold you on, know. Hold on, hold on, hold on, <laughs> hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Everybody had the same time, but everybody has different directions that they go, okay? If you look at what some of the other ones did, look at the technique to the, to what they did. Was it Was it a lot of technique to it or was it just straight grilling and sauteing and things like that i'm not defending michelle i'm defending chefs that are in her position yeah so speaking speaking of time management though i think dan dan kind of found a cheat code around it he was roasting he was doing a vegetarian kind of spread so his big component was like a beet tartare and he was having a rough time at the beginning he was roasting it and when he pulled them out to check they were still hard as rocks He's like, what am I going to do? I'm not going to have t- enough time. Well, he thinks of sous vide. He throws them in a sous vide, lets them sous vide overnight to, to, to you know, get them nice and tender. And I thought, wow, that was genius. And then I kind of thought, 
is that cheating a little bit? Because, you know, when that clock hits zero, everybody stops cooking, right? But his sous vide is still going. It's cooking overnight, which, I, I mean, I don't know. I, I, I thought it was a brilliant move by him to sous vide it. And I think Savannah might have been able to do that with Octopus because her octa she was going to do like a, she did an octopus thing on this challenge. And if she had a sous vide the octopus, it would not have come out the way it came out. It, it didn't come out great. Um, but her overall table looked, look great. So we'll talk about that here in a little bit. But did you feel Dan using a sous vide machine to cook the beets as as a cheat code or as straight up cheating? <laughs> I thought that was a brilliant idea. And since I'm fairly new to, to do sous vide, I ain't mad at him. But here's the thing though. They had it, he used what was in the kitchen. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. He used what was in the kitchen. And does the rule say you have to stop cooking and get out of the kitchen or all the cooking is done yeah, I don't that know. day. Yeah. Yeah. I so don't like know. I said, it was it was the but here's the thing though. The this is why I always tell the chefs, you can't be one dimensional and you have to use you have to learn about all the technology that's out there because you never know when you're gonna need it. Like perfect example, uh the combi oven. Excuse me, the combi oven. When it first, when I was in Seattle years ago, and my buddy who worked at a, uh, a restaurant uh, store, every new piece of equipment that would come in, he brought me in and showed me how it works. This is what this does. If you do that, this would do that. Now I'm at a position where now I have a combi oven now at the facility I'm at, and I know about it. I don't know everything about it or how to do it. But at least I'm familiar with it. So if I need something done real quick, I can put it in the combi oven. I can uh, cook it and hold it the whole nine yards. Same thing with this sous vide. Man, my, my, my beets are not cooking. What am I going to do? I need these beets. It's the main ingredient. I know. Look, they got a sous vide. Choo! Yep. And they came out. I'm not mad at them at all. I'm not mad oh, no, at them at all. I'm not either. I mean, if, if you have sous vide available and, and you're allowed to use it on a show like Top Chef, then I highly recommend you use it because it, it just takes a lot of the guesswork out of it. it. It takes a lot of thinking out of it. As long as you know the time and the temperature, you're good. Uh, and, and when he came back, he was happy with it. He was, you know, it, it was like he wanted it. Yeah, yeah, you know, exactly. I, I needed that this particular. Now, granted, like you say, time and temperature, he must know that unless he had it written down somewhere or Googled it or whatever. I don't know time and temp. I know time and temperature what I've been using. Like I did uh, salmon last night for um, uh, 40, 45 minutes at 129 degrees. Yeah. You know, yeah. steak, you know, 139, you know, that, that kind of stuff. So yeah. um, if you use it a lot, you know what it is. Yeah. So he he pulled the trigger on on the right technique at the right time. So some yes. other some other uh, strategy. Danny Danny's instinct was to do a paella. I thought that was a good choice. Paella is just a big communal dish anyway, so I thought that was a really good way to go. Uh, Savannah's had a Savannah had a really interesting uh, thing that she was doing. She worked in a Japanese restaurant, had a lot of Japanese influence. So she's celebrating the sea, and she was planning on doing something called a zen a zensai which is the first course of a kaiseki meal. Uh, so her her table looked really, really good. Laura's uh, was the only dessert, and she had some experience with this kind of like tabletop plating concept uh, working at 11 Madison Park. Um, Danny also had some experience with this working. He stodged at Alinea, so he's seen it in action. Let's talk about Manny. So Manny decides to fall into the risotto trap. It's a trap! Uh, as if he doesn't know, he saw his power bottom buddy, Kevin, go home on a risotto earlier this season. And risotto is just, it, they called it Top Chef Curse for a reason. Eight people over the course of 21 seasons uh, have gone home because of bad risotto. So it's, it's don't do risotto on Top yeah, Chef. Here's the thing, though. Here's the crazy part. Not only don't do risotto, but don't do risotto when you throw, put it on a table and let it get cold. Yeah. He was trying to and time he, it. He was trying to time it, though. Thing, though. I know. I've said this on not just Top Chef, on many, many, many food competitions. As soon as someone says, oh, man, 
I got this. I've been doing this all my life. They're not going to win. So when he, he said, I've cooked more risotto than tortillas, dude, you're not going to do well. <laughs> and to me, and he, that's the curse of any food competition when somebody's like, oh, that, and on top chef, you see it all the time. They bring out an item. Oh, my God. Oh, I grew up doing this. Oh, yeah. I do this in my restaurant. I do this, this. And when you, when you put it out, it's like, dude, you just told us you cook more risotto than you do tortillas, and you're a Mexican chef. Tell me something different. And then he made black squid, and all his seafood's overcooked. It's yeah. like, dude, you're, you're, you're missing the mark on so many levels. And then, like I said, he should have been gone home weeks ago because even though he's calling everything in, you're trying to put a middle where there's no middle. Yeah. So with with Manny, what his thought process was, he you know he was told in the last challenge and last few challenges that look, you're predictable, you're too safe. So he was he was again gonna try to hit a home run, and and there's no bigger home run than if you can pull off risotto in Top Chef. So I. I I, I guess I get what he was thinking, but you know, the the better part of your brain should have thought no, but I, I mean he he did not he did not say that to himself. So he yeah, he overcooked every single one of his proteins uh, on the table, and then that risotto hit that cold table and it immediately seized up and uh yeah, it became spackle right before their eyes. So uh yeah, it, it, I, I I don't know why. <laughs> Don't cook risotto on top chef. Don't cook risotto really on any cooking competition where there's time involved because you're just you're just not going to be able to pull it out. I, I I don't care how good of a chef you are, you're you're not going to pull off risotto in a timed cooking competition. It's a trap. Wow. Yeah. I, w- I was. I was. Like I said, Danny right now seems like he's just going downhill. He's in quicksand right now. Yeah. I like the guy, but you're going in quicksand, and every after every challenge. You're just going deeper and deeper and deeper. Think about this. There was nothing. They said it, the flavor was great there, but everything was spackled, overcooked. Mm-hmm. Just. Yeah. Yeah. So let's talk about meal service and kind of what the judges said about each uh, table of food. So Danny was up first. He did a paella with black rice and piquillo pepper puree uh, with a frame of black garlic, zucchini, and creme fraiche purees. I thought it looked stunning. Uh, the frame yeah. looked really good. Um, Curtis thought the border was actually tape, but then he swiped through it and said, oh, this is a sauce. Uh, Gail liked the use of the white space, uh, and it tastes pretty good, said Tom. Uh, he praised the cook of the seafood. Kristen said the texture of the rice was fantastic, and she said, I've got no notes. No higher praise than you can get from a judge well, on a cooking competition that, that says, is, I got no notes. Look, the fun thing about that one is he, he was like, I burnt my rice. It's smoking. Yeah, the that's right. And he, he like, oh, I got it. But here's the thing. That's the sign of a great chef that you're like, uh-oh, caught it, pivoted, fixed it, boom. Yep. Great job. Yep. He scooped out the top layer of rice that didn't have a, a burnt taste to it and was able to spread it out. Uh, it, within the dimensions of what he had without it looking like he was lacking something. So, so good on him yep. for being, being able to do that. Dan was up next. He did a beet tartare with beet puree, fried kale and pumpkin seed puree uh, with a fried kale salad and candy pumpkin seeds, scallion powder, black garlic, lobno with harissa oil, horseradish emulsion, and a, something he called a puffin. He was trying to make a pita, but he decided not to put it in the oven instead cooked it on the flat top and it kind of was a cross between what he, a pita and an English muffin, so he just called it a puffin. So Dan in, inventing a new a new food right right in front of our eyes. His table also looked really good. It, it was very a lot of references to Jackson Pollock, so it looked very Jackson Pollock esque, just sauces right. thrown everywhere. Uh, Curtis called it playful and fun. Gail loved the puffins. Uh, Tom liked how he could mix and match the different ingredients. And then Kristen had, Kristen looked like she had the most fun judging this particular challenge with everybody. She takes the two puffins and, and like is playing with the food and smashes, like grabs all the ingredients with the two, two puffins and makes this huge, like beet sandwich with it. Um, she just had a smile on her face through the whole night and, and was like finger painting through some of the, some of the sauces. So, um, she had a lot of fun. what did you think of dance? 
great, great job. Like I said, you know, once again, another one of those chefs that has the 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 experience in a kitchen to say, oh, this not working. Let me switch technique. But this is why I like cooking versus baking. Because in baking, once you put it in the oven, you gotta go to church and pray to God and come out. Yeah. So I'm I'm all about the cooking process. And like I said, you can pivot in the middle of your cooking. Um, great job, Dan. Like I said, I've, I've been telling you for weeks now. I'm a fan of Dan. Yeah. I'm a yep. big fan. Of, I'm a big fan of his because he's he's cooking some great food and he's really representing Wisconsin. Yeah. Yeah, he's representing Wisconsin really well. So Manny, he did a squid ink risotto with crab scallops and shrimp, Calabrian chili oil, sun-dried tomato puree, and pesto uh, trapanese. Curtis thought the black risotto looked good against the white table, which, you know, that, that's the that's the that's probably the best thing he could have said <laughs> about his table. Uh, Gail did think the flavor yeah. of the risotto was good, um, but Curtis's mouth was on fire for a long time because of the Calabrian chili sauce, uh, Calabrian chili oil. He thought it was way too spicy. Um, and then of course we talked about the risotto seizing up, uh, yeah, just kind of a clunker of a table. Uh, Michelle did cured salmon, a salmon mousse, beet biscuits, pickled beets, and capers. She was really going for, I, I guess, kind of like a charcuterie board, but man, when she, when they showed it, it was really tiny, like it against that really large white table. It just was not in, not enough for her. Um, she, Gail thought the tiny food presentation was too bunched together, needed room to breathe. Tom didn't think it tasted right collectively. He said, this doesn't feel like her at all. Or Kristen said, this doesn't feel like her at all. Um, and we talked about that about earlier when she said, you know, be yourself, cook who you are. And she kind of did the exact opposite of that. Um, and she actively avoided, you know, the things that she would be good at in this kind of a challenge. So we, you know, we, I think we beat Michelle up a little too long already. So we'll, We'll move on. All our and and um, so the last two to present were Savannah and Laura. And I thought the editing between those two were hilarious where they showed Savannah being all kind of manic and, and, you know, shucking oysters really fast and in a hurry. And Laura's just kind of, you know, waltzing through the kitchen, taking her time, thoughtfully spooning the sauces onto the table, just kind of, with with some classical music playing in the background. Uh, what did you think of that contrast? In like we talked about, everybody's got the same amount of time, but some people are just harried and some people just understand that and have that kind of ticking clock in the back of their head. Well, I I, I see, you know, the, the, the turtle in the hair going on right there. And Laura was like, had a lot of purees and sauces and powders and everything like that. And... You know, her counterpart was just, and because she was cooking more and doing more things. Yeah. Um, but I, like I said, it's it's all on how that particular chef handles their time and their breathing. Yeah. It was just ripping and running, running around. She was sitting there just putting little dollops and stroking them down. And her table, looked, Laura's table looked amazing. Yeah. It looks so so whimsically flavorful, tasty, and all that good stuff. So, um, like I said, editing is always fun to watch. Yeah, I, th I thought you they know, were being it, funny. It, yeah, even on my show, I was like, I was watching other before my show came. I was watching the other um, Extreme Chef uh, episodes to see how they cut up things. And then when I saw mine, I'm like, wow, they cut out a lot. They <laughs> added and put it there and. Yeah, it was crazy. It, yeah, it was. I was like, "Wow, did I really say that? I didn't say that when I did that." Oh, they got the voice and put it over here and did that. Yeah, so yeah. editing is, is real big in these competitions. So let's talk about Savannah's table and and take a deep breath because hers was a lot. So <laughs> she did a kombu cured salmon nigiri with mustard green wasabi, shrimp tempura with yuzu salt and yuzu ponzu daikon gane, boiled and grilled octopus with, a, with wasabi, seared tuna and fennel pollen, coriander and white pepper with black garlic soy glaze, oyster with ahi amarillo sauce, and champagne gelée and caviar. I mean, she really went for it. I thought the table looked really cool. Like, it, everything had a, like what Tom said, everything kind of had a purpose. Uh, you go from kind of the end of the table and you moved your way to the middle and you ate all the different small pieces of, of different seafood all culminating into this like 
uh, mountain of oysters in the middle of the table. Uh, unfortunately, though, the, the octopus didn't really come out well. It was the texture was mushy. It was overcharred. Um, Gail found the tempura a little bit greasy, but she said the oysters at the end were great. Um, what do you think of Savannah's, uh, you know, Kaiseki inspired dish? Very nice. But I think all their points on that made made sense, especially about being a greasy. You can see the grease spots on the on the on the table. Yeah. And so the char on the on the octopus, you can see a little dark. Um, but like I say, the going that extra mile and and going down that road, because a Kaisaki road is 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 a hard road to go down. Um, but she pulled it off in what she could in that time, in that time slot. Um, if you ever get a chance to have a Kaisaki dinner, it, it, it's amazing. Um, but she did, she did what she could in the, in the modern times she had. Yeah. I mean, I, I thought it again, was, but once again, she did a lot of cooking and frying and all this stuff. And Laura didn't do all those things. She went, she went the sweet style. Yeah. So it's more gentle and, Okay, when that's done, I, while that's baking, I can put this sauce and this puree and this powder. So that's why they did the the contrast. Somebody yeah. running around like a chicken without a head, and then Laura moving around like a snail, like, oh, I got this. So speaking of Laura, um, she she brings up the end with dessert, and I, I thought it looked beautiful. She did a, a rose sour cherry pistachio and honey sauces with uh something called Maris, which is turkey ice cream or turkey, Turkish, sorry, not turkey. Turkey would be horrible. Turkish ice cream. Uh, she said it was kind of chewy, which I was kind of trying to visualize what that is. But have you ever seen those videos of the Turkish ice cream guy kind of playing tricks on people getting, getting ice cream, you know, from his, from his vendor? Like have you seen that on TikTok, TikTok and YouTube? Oh. It, it's this really kind of stretchy, chewy ice cream, and, and he kind of plays keep away with the customer. So he puts puts the ice cream on a cone, hands it to him, and then with his long spatula, you know, pulls it back and then switches cones. It's just neat these neat hand tricks that he that these vendors do in in Turkey with this ice cream. Okay. Um, but uh, the texture, I, I'm I'm kind of glad Tom said it. It was like um, a mochi and ice cream had a baby. So that that really gave me an idea of of what the texture would be like. And now I want to try it. Uh, so hopefully I can find a place that that's got it maybe here in Jacksonville. Um, and then, uh, so she did that with a sour cherry and honey, uh, Maris, uh, meringue and baklava. So the baklava I think is what put it over the top for her. Um, she really nailed the presentation as well. It looked beautiful. She put the ring of baklava on the table and told them to, you know, break it up with a spoon and, Curtis loved the baklava um, and he, every bite was different. Tom said every bite was interesting and every bite was different. Um, and Kristen feels the table service had a purpose. And uh, Gail said all the flavors are clear, beautiful and fun. So looking at that dish and the interactivity of it with breaking up the baklava and, and scooping that up with, with this very interesting textural ice cream, um, I think is what, what kind of tipped Laura over the edge? Because I really thought it was going to be between um, Laura, Savannah, and and maybe Dan. Um, but both uh, Dan or uh, Savannah had some some trips in there. But Laura's was was basically almost perfect. So what did we think of of Laura's dessert? Loved it, loved it. I thought she did a great job, presentation wise, um, interactive. Because when you have a, a an experience like that, it should be interactive. So she did a great job, really yeah. great job on it. Yep. And she came back from Last Chance Kitchen, and this is what I'm doing. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So you know, we get to judges' table. The top three are Laura, Danny, and Dan. Um, and then Laura comes back. She wins the thing. She comes back from LCK swinging, um, and she gets an advantage in the next elimination challenge. So. Uh, the bottom two were Manny and Michelle, and we talked about not finding. There's no middle, but Savannah kind of found her way into the middle with her yeah. with her plating. She was safe. She wasn't the top, but she was not the bottom either. So it was between Manny and Michelle, um, and uh, you know Michelle got eliminated. So give me your thoughts. This was this was kind of you were saying her praises. She was an early pick for you in the draft um, when you heard Michelle. Pack your knives and go. What were you thinking? 
Manny should have gone. <laughs> well, Manny walk me through. Gone. Walk me through your thought process on that. Okay, so Manny, and we've talked about this how Manny should have been gone a couple of weeks ago. But on this one, you do risotto, which everybody knows you don't do risotto, and you screwed it up. All your protein, everything was just overcooked. The only thing that stood out in your in your dish was that they said your risotto had good flavor, but you, I just think Manny called it in once again. He just throwing things against the wall and hope it sticks. So, so mine, when, when I saw this happening, I was like, how is this guy still in the, how is mediocre Manny still in the competition? But how are you here? This is <laughs> mediocre Manny. <laughs> this <laughs> This is the fifth time he's been on the bottom and he's somehow still skating through. And it's another example of how the quick fires are supposed to matter, but they don't. He was in the bottom of the quick fire and the bottom of the elimination challenge again, just like he was last week. And he lives to cook another day. How many more chefs are going to have to be sacrificed at the altar of mediocre Manny so he can cook another day? I, even, I mean, even Gail said during the judges table, I don't think the quick fire needs to be part of this conversation conversation. Yes, the hell it does because he was on the bottom twice. He's been on the bottom. I, I know you can't judge the current uh, round of dishes based on the past performances of other episodes, but you, you can't escape the fact that he's been on the bottom five times and he's still, he's, he's two cooks away from winning this thing. I, I don't, I don't, I don't get it. I, I think overall, this head snapping change of of the quick fires not mattering, and then all of a sudden the quick fires now matter in the same season. I, I just don't, I don't think this needs to happen next season. I, I hope they do away with this. I hope they read the the internet banter about how awful this is, and decide let's go back to the way quick fires were. Give them immunity if they win, maybe cash. But clearly, the show doesn't know how to do this. I, I don't, I don't understand how this show works anymore. And it's pissing me off. I, I don't like why, why are you doing it? It's a bad rule change. Um, even the, it, it's just bad all around it. It'll, I don't know. I, I, I just don't well, know. Here's my thing. Like I say, I've, 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 I've stopped watching top chef for a couple of reasons, but seeing chefs like Manny skate through and everybody, all, all these other chefs are falling by the wayside. It's like, that's one of the reasons I, I stopped watching um, Top Chef. There's a couple of other reasons, too. Um, but like I said, I don't know how Manny continues to keep skating through. And he's making, he did what Savannah did unintentionally. Savannah found the middle unintentionally. He found it intentionally. Yeah. Because when they, when they brought, Manny and Michelle up, they told her, hey, you good, you, you're safe. Manny has been safe for five weeks in a row. Why? Yeah. yeah. Even though he's on my team and I picked him, he started off strong, but as we get close to the end, he just mediocre Manny. I guess, that, I guess that's his new nickname now. Because <laughs> it's like, dude. And if, if, even on this week, when they were going to commercial, they showed him with his hands on his hips, his head in the air, like, I know I messed that up. I know yeah. I'm going home. And yeah. here he is sitting home, Michelle, and like, dude, yeah, if he's in the top two, once again, I'll be done with Top Chef. <laughs> once yeah. Again, I, I'll, be with, I'll be done with Top Chef. I'm interested to see what happens in the next couple of episodes, but and here's the other thing too. Here's, here's my other thing that that makes me mad. Tom, you've been doing this long enough, not just Top Chef, but in the industry long enough to see when somebody's phoning shit in. Kirsten, you've been in that position. You should see when he's just phoning shit in. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. And Gail, same thing with you. You've been there since day one. You see him hiding behind everybody else, and you still allow him to do that. Yeah. Here's my here's my here's my thing. Here's the thing too. After this season is over with, please do not bring Manny back as an all star. <laughs> I I honestly don't. I to be fair, okay, and, and I say this of, of all the of all the chefs, Manny included. 
outside of Top Chef, Manny and and these other chefs are are great. They have to be to be on the show. They're they're great in their own environment. Yeah. But yeah. I I do not see I do not see any all stars coming out of this season. If if there's an all star season in the future, which I'm sure there's going to be. I, I just don't see any all-stars coming out of Wisconsin. It's it's unfortunate. I mean, but the, 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 the casting has been a, a little rough this season overall. There have been some standouts, um, you know, Sue, Savannah, um, Rossica, Danny, I think are, are really great. But, but overall, I just think it's, it's been a lackluster season and, and it's kind of a rebuilding year, right? We, we we're coming off of Portland, Houston and London probably three of the greatest seasons of top chef ever in 21 seasons. So you're coming from like the bulls winning, you know, back-to-back championships to now rebuilding because Jordan left the team. So this is where we're at. We're in a rebuilding year back in the States coming from world all-stars. And, you know, it's, it's, so let me ask you this thing. how do you, how do you go out and find these talents? The ones that you know, that's going to perform from beginning to the end. Well, I mean, I, I mean, I don't know. I've never had to cast a reality show before, but uh, th- you know, the things you look for are personality, personality, looks, charisma, that kind of thing, and then you kind of just hope they're able to to cook well for fourteen weeks. So, but here's the thing, though. It, I, I I think it's like, like perfect example. You you want to rebuild? Okay, cool. But how do you find the ones that you're doing? I can tell you that I'm the best pastry chef in the world. Show you videos of me doing stuff and stuff like that. But until you put me under the clock, then you got to see what the pressure is. If I tell you I'm the best pastry chef, I, sh- I, I send you my bio. I send you everything you ask for. I drive great conversation and, you know, the interview and everything. But you've never seen me cook. Yeah. I, I mean, I think... I think a couple of things come into play, like with, with Portland and Houston, those were kind of the COVID seasons. You had a lot of chefs that were out of work. So you had a lot more, I think the pool of chefs to pull from, from those two seasons was a lot larger. I mean, you had Shota Nakajima coming on to top. When I heard he was on top chef in Portland, I was like, holy crap, Shota's on top chef. That's amazing. So you had him and then you had Buddha coming out of Houston and then going into world all-stars. So you had two seasons kind of that were in those COVID seasons and, and chefs just didn't, you know, they, they wanted to get on the show, promote their restaurants so that when you come out of COVID, you got something, you can grow your business again. Now that we're past COVID with the Wisconsin episode uh, and you know, London kind of anomaly being the world all-stars, but you're out of COVID now, all the restaurants are back open. I, I think maybe that pool of talent got a little bit smaller now because chefs are back working, you know, 16, 18 hours a day. And, and, you know, they can't find the time to try to fit top chef into their lives. So that's, that's my theory. I don't know. Well, here's the thing though. I, I'm going to say this of all the chefs on there that I would say stood out to me, who you think my number one person would be? Uh, I'm, I don't know. I'm going to say maybe Danny or Rossica was Dan. Dan. Oh yeah. 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 Dan. Dan's doing really well. Dan. I mean, and the reason I like him is he's doing things in his hometown that we lose a draw. He'll be a fan favorite in Wisconsin. Yeah, I think so too. Cause he's, he's done, the uh, the supper club did great with that. Did great with the 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 fish boil. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. <laughs> Even though he hated it at first, he's like, "Oh, I can do a fish boil. Who knows? Danny may be the, Dan may be doing fish boils now and, and making a killing off of it." But I think Dan has really stuck to his guns as to what he is and how he does things. Yeah. So I'm I'm very happy with him. Rossica, like I say, she was on my team. Uh, loved her to death. Um, I think the other person that stuck out, that still sticks out to me, is Danny and Laura. Yeah, Laura's Laura's uh, doing really well. I, I, I think Laura, if she does what she keeps doing, she may be an all star because she may win this coming out of Last Chance, Last Chance Kitchen. Yeah. So very well could be. Like I said, like I say, Danny, Laura, Dan, um, 
Of course, you know, I'm always going to be a, a fan of uh, Michelle. I wish I could have seen more of Charlie, though. Chef Pierre. Yeah. I wish I could have seen, seen more of him. Yeah. Uh, um, so, yeah, like I said, it, it's going to be interesting to see. But here's the other thing, too. It's going to be interesting to see when they get to uh, the, the smaller group, if they're going to bring these chefs back to help them cook or whatever. Oh yeah, you know they are. When they get down to the last three, they're gonna bring the eliminated chefs back to be their sous chefs for their for their final yeah. meals. So, so Michelle goes home. Manny stays. Uh, you know he's he's making a lot of technical and unforced errors, so he's got to stop doing that if he if he wants to win this thing. Uh, and for Michelle, unfortunately, there's no last chance kitchen anymore. We're we're done with that. So there's no more last chance kitchen. She's she's gone gone. Um, so let's do a quick draft point update. So Savannah was the quick fire winner, so she gets your five points. Top of the judges' table was Danny and Dan and Laura. So Danny and Dan get you three uh, three points. Well, Dan gets me three points. He's the only guy on my team left. Um, so I'm glad we're still generating points in that sense. Danny gets you three <laughs> points for being in the top. And then Laura wins the elimination challenge, so she gets seven points. Um, so I guess the advantage for you – or disadvantage for you having – most of the chefs left is the bottom of the judge's table <laughs> You're, are all going to go to you. Uh, negative two points for Manny and Michelle, both being in the bottom of the judge's table. Uh, so that's going to hurt you a little bit, but not too much because for the episode total, you had 11 points to my three. And then for the show totals, uh, you have 106 and I have 43. So we are, uh, <laughs> I, I am almost, well, I'm bad at math, but I'm I'm pretty sure I'm mathematically out of this at this point, even if Dan just ran the table for the rest of the rest of the season, which, you know, there's uh-huh. not very many episodes left. I think in the preview, they said, you know, there's five people left and, you know, the winner, the winner's here. You're you're one cook away from the finals. So we're getting towards the end uh, of, of our of our uh, episodic recaps. And it's going to be an exciting, hopefully an exciting uh, final. And we'll see who who gets there. So. Uh, Chef, yeah, um, any I'm final thoughts? Um, I'm looking forward to seeing who's going to be at that at that last table. Um, and, you know, hopefully Manny's not there. I mean, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Poor Manny. He started off so so well, and now we're kind of like, is this guy going to go home or what? <laughs> yes, I need to put him on the bench. Dude, you need the bench. <laughs> um, but no, like I said, but all, all in all, I think all the chefs, except for one, and we know who that is, is um, has been amazingly creative and they, they're putting forth, you know, all this effort for that. Because not only are they on the show, but they, they put their life, their personal life on hold for, for what, two months or whatever it is. Yeah. So you got to give them up to them. That's not an easy thing to do. As they talked about in the show, you know, I miss my wife and she's five minutes away or my fiance. Um, uh, Michelle, her boyfriend, and all these great big supporters of, you know, what they're doing. So, yeah, big hats off to not just the chefs, but their loved ones and the supporters back at home. I think we need to get the staff that's cooking without them and everything like that. So, yeah, so let's give it up to those those folks as well. Yep, yep. Well, I want to give you the last kind of last few words here. What do you got going on? What are some things that people need to be aware of and uh, that follow you or, or you know, what Chef Amadeus up to in the next couple of weeks? So Chef Amadeus now is working with uh, some kids with a culinary program and we'll be doing um, the reason I don't have my podcast up and running yet is because I'm working with these kids to get their podcast up first. I'm putting the kids first putting their podcast up and we're going to be working with um, local chefs and regional chefs on getting them the, uh, having the, the whole hospitality industry come in and uh, talk to them. So give them different uh, roads to take in this industry. And I always tell them, you don't have to be in a restaurant. You could do there's so many other things you can do. So I'm happy to be doing that. Um, and we're going to be doing a lot of fundraising for uh, this particular group because we want to make sure that I give them every advantage they can. Um, and then once again, just follow me on Instagram at Chef Amadeus, um, TikTok at Chef Amadeus, Facebook fans of Chef Amadeus. And of course, my spice is on, on my website, chefamadeus.net. Uh, swing by, pick some up. And um, yeah, that's about it. Awesome. Awesome. 
we'll make sure you follow him so you can keep everybody up to date on on how he's working with these kids and furthering education and molding young minds. And uh, don't forget to follow me on socials at Rich Rare and at Eat Your Content on TikTok, Facebook, Instagram, uh, all the social media channels. And make sure to like, follow, and subscribe on your podcast player of choice and on YouTube so you know when new episodes of Eat Your Content drop. Chef Amadeus, thanks again for your time. We're getting close to the end, but I appreciate you, you know, hanging out with me these last few weeks, and and we'll uh, hopefully uh, knock it out of the park here in the next couple of weeks. Yeah, it's been a blast.